Good afternoon. I am speaking to the CEO of Enveric Biosciences. His name is Joseph Tucker. He's a PhD. Uh, this is the first time I've had uh, him on Goldfinger Capital, and we're going to learn a lot about brain health, the 5H2A, 5H2C space today with Dr. Tucker. Uh, you know, hey, Joseph, how are you doing this afternoon? Uh, great. Thanks for having me here, uh, and nice to chat with you. Yeah, it's, it's our pleasure. Uh, I reached out to you after a stock with the symbol drug on the NASDAQ. It's Bright Minds Biosciences had this incredible move a couple weeks ago from a dollar a share to almost $100 a share. And I said, hey, I know a couple of guys who are in this space who would know something about this. So I sent you an email and you responded and here we are. Um, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became the CEO? Sure. So I'm uh, I'm a scientist by training, as you mentioned, my PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry. Um, but for the last 25 years, I've been working with scientists looking for opportunities just like this, where the science is out there indicating there's a great opportunity for a drug that's needed and that it's been overlooked, basically, and that somebody needs to bring this forward. So I've been doing that my whole career. The last few years, I've been very interested in this field that initially was kicked off and was called, you know, by many people, the psychedelics sector. And there was a lot of enthusiasm around it, which I thought was a, a little bit misplaced. People were enthusiastic because, you know, psychedelics are taboo and, oh gosh, now it's going to suddenly be cool or good. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm around that. But as a scientist, what's really amazing is the how potent these molecules are when they act on certain receptors in the brain. They have very powerful effects, uh, which is why they were, which is why they were used or abused recreationally as psychedelics, why they were made illegal 50, 60 years ago because of their potent effect. But that potent effect can be, you know, if you'll pardon me saying it, used for good. Right, we can use it to treat patients who have real issues, and you know this family of receptors are these what are called the serotonergic receptors, which is a brain a brain receptor, a neurotransmitter. Serotonin is the natural molecule, and so what Longboard and Bright Minds, these companies in this particular space, they're in particular targeting. 5-HT, what's called 5-HT2C, um, which is one of the serotonergic uh, receptors. There are others like 5-HT2A that are what classic psychedelics target. So they're very closely related molecules. Anyway, so I got into this space because I'm a scientist and I saw this hugely powerful class of molecules that had not been you know, fully developed for human health. And I, I had to be a part of that. So that's why I've been doing this for the last few years. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I've I've been following it since 2020, the you know, medical psychedelic space. And from an investor standpoint, it's been a bit of a train wreck because a lot of these companies went to market very early stage, um, actually kind of too early in, in, in some ways. And they went to market with very high expectations, with pretty high valuations. And the wind sort of went out of the sales, you know, of the sector as the Fed raised interest rates throughout 2022 and into 2023. But for the first time in a few years, I feel a real sense of optimism about the, the you know, this space and what happened with Longboard, which, by the way, was a, a two billion dollar acquisition, uh, you know, that was announced, uh, you know, two weeks ago. Uh, the symbol is LBPH on the NASDAQ. And then what it did with, uh, you know, Bright Minds and, you know, just a, a stratospheric move in, in that stock drug on the NASDAQ is a symbol, I, a move like I've almost never seen from basically almost a dollar a share to almost a hundred dollars a share in, in one week. Um, and we've seen we've seen a little bit of pickup in in Cybin and MindMed and a few of the other ones. Still, they're they're still very 
far down. But I feel like the sector is shifting and it's not so much focused on, you know, psychedelics per se, but some of these sort of, I guess, non-psychedelic compounds that are are close, uh, you know, cousins of the psychedelics, like MDMA, psilocybin, you know, some of the, the main ones, you know, that we know about. Um, so tell us about and Varick, you know, the company that you're the CEO of, and what are you focused on? Sure. So, and, and I actually, I'll start by saying, I, I agree with you on all the points you just made that it was, you know, when the sector got started, there was, you know, I don't want to say the hype, but there's too much hype. There were, there were a lot of companies with high expectations. They appeared to be very advanced, you know, suddenly mid-stage trials, out of thin air, they raised a lot of money. And, you know, it was almost inevitable that there would be this crash. And if anything, you know, the M the FDA review of the Lycos molecule, which was the first psychedelic, if you will, in the space to go forward, and they did not get approval after completing their trials. In many ways, in my mind, was the nail in the coffin for the original classic psychedelics. Now, there's a lot of companies that you mentioned and that others are aware of who have, have, haven't got the memo yet. <laughs> they're, they're still out there because um, maybe they've committed themselves. They've gone so far down this path, they can't turn that battleship around. But um, you're right. I, I also am seeing, I feel a shift in the market right now. And this is a great, this is a great time to be talking about bright minds and you know, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm not associated in any way with Bright Lines. They're another company I'm aware of, but I think it's a, I, I, I believe it's a harbinger of what's going on, this shift in the market. And so what Enveric is doing is we're also interested in this serotonergic space, this 5-HT. 5-HT, by the way, is the um, short form, a scientific short form for serotonin. So when somebody says a 5-HT receptor, it stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is the, the actual scientific name, chemical name for serotonin. So with 5-HT, the various receptors, 2A is the one that is known for being associated with inducing neuroplasticity, this new, or let's say revitalized concept of inducing neuroplasticity in these molecules called neuroplastogens. And then you have 5-HT2C, which is closely related, but all of these are naturally targeted by serotonin to one degree or another. So at Enveric, we saw the opportunity of going after these class of receptors and all the um, potential health indications that can be pursued. We also saw some time ago the risk of proceeding with molecules that cause hallucinations. You know, we we shifted some time ago our main focus to be in the non-hallucinogenic space, recognizing that it was going to be a real challenge to get through the FDA. And, you know, we saw that now with Lycos and their attempt to get MDA approved, which was unsuccessful. So our focus is on molecules that are similarly shaped, similar structures, target these receptors but don't cause hallucinations. And we're very interested in the 2A receptor because that seems to be highly indicated for things like depression and you know, major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression, potentially for anxiety indications or even PTSD. So we're very interested in molecules that engage that receptor, but don't cause the classic psychedelic hallucinatory response. We're also interested in 2C, 5-HT2C, another very interesting receptor that has been the target in the past of a number of interesting drugs and is in fact, you know, the main story behind the Bright Minds and Longboard recent shift in the market. Yeah, that's a great point you brought up about Lycos and the MDMA, you know, approval um, of all the psychedelics. That was the one that was supposed to be the easiest. It was the front runner. 
um, based upon a, a, a lot of anecdotes and a lot of positive press the last couple of years, it seemed that MDMA was a shoe in to, to get FDA approval for the treatment of PTSD, but they hit a roadblock because the FDA panel brought up a lot of issues with how they conducted the trials. And it just sort of put a negative light on all the, the, the psychedelic uh, trials and, and companies. I, I hope we're past that now. And I, I do have hope that, you know, still, you know, MDA, MA could get FDA approval in the future and hopefully it will. And, and some of the other ones uh, can as well, but you make a good point about the, the psychedelic experience. Um, some people may not be well, well equipped to have a full psychedelic journey. And also just the intensity of some of those experiences means that you have to have uh, strong supervision of the experience it's not something you're going to do at home by yourself um it just it, it it really complicates things a whole lot so i i like the idea of sort of a, a non-psychedelic drug just a pill that you can take at home um so 5ht2a um the, so so you know this is more focused on uh, you know, help me a little bit. It's 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 more of uh, you know sensory experiences, right? Yeah. So five HT two A, you know, it's one of fourteen different related five HT receptors in the body. What we have, and and these are neurotransmitters, right? So largely in the brain, although there's off there are also these receptors in different parts of the body doing interestingly different things. So 5-HT2A, as an example, there are quite a few receptors for 5-HT2A in the gut, which mm. is probably why there's a strong, um, you know, vomiting response when you take drugs that mm. hit the 5-HT2A receptor because they're down there in the gut as well. So the, what happens with, and, and I'm not, so I'm a, I'm a biochemist. I'm a molecular biologist. I'll admit I'm not uh, a pure neuroscientist myself, but what's going on with 5-HT2A is when you activate it with, you know, a, some molecule that hits the receptor, you're actually kind of overloading some of the other systems in the brain downstream. So you, you basically have too much signaling going on in certain systems in the brain and this overload presents itself in the form of hallucinations, right? visual auditory hallucinations, this overload, that seems to be an effect, another effect that happens when you hit the 2A receptor and turn it on, is this increase in con connectivity between existing neurons in the brain. So you've got you know, all these neurons are out there and they're connecting with each other and what you seem to do is it's not that you create new neurons, which is a process called neurogenesis. You're not mm -hmm. creating new neurons, but the ones that are there, the connections they make with other neurons that are already there increases. Both the number of connections and these connections themselves, they have this, it's kind of like this branching that they do. And they kind of, they look almost furry when they have more branches on them. So you increase this branching as well as the connections. So you haven't increased the, you haven't increased the number of neurons, but you've increased the communication between the two. And that, this is neuroplasticity, is inducing neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, yep. Neuroplasticity, which, which is a fancy word that says, essentially means rewiring the brain, right? Or mm -hmm. increasing the wiring that's already there. It's already there, you're just making the signal greater. And that seems to be, as best we can tell, underlying or underpinning the problem, the physical deficiency in the brains of people that have long-term depression, long-term PTSD, different regions of the brain over time are communicating less with each other mm. than they should. And so we're turning that back up. Mm. So 2A seems to do both of these things. 
And so, and there's still, a, you know, I'll, I'll be straight up. There's a scientific controversy being explored right now by the leading minds in the field who are saying one camp, uh, I would say this is more the historical camp, are saying in order to get the benefit of the patient, you must have the hallucination. The hallucination is how the benefit is achieved. Mm. And, and that includes the neuroplasticity. There's another more current camp that says those are two separate things. They're not sequential. You can induce neuroplasticity and you can induce hallucination. And the two are separate. And so that se second camp says, if we can cut out the hallucination, only have the neuroplasticity and still get the benefit. Now we've got that pill you mentioned, Robert. Now we've got <laughs> that drug which is accessible to everybody, much more scalable, no psychotherapy, no oversight. Now you got something big, right? Do we know? No, it's still, these are still hypotheses being tested. Mm -hmm. That's how cutting edge it is. It's but very it exciting. It's very exciting uh, because it is it is so scalable, and and that's you know with 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 some of the the drugs that MindMed and and Cybin are are well you know they they they're also uh, I've noticed in some of their phase two trials that they're they're lowering the dosing. So even though yeah it might be a mild psychedelic experience, it's not probably going to be super intense, um, but having a completely non-psychedelic pill that you could just take once daily and have all these tremendous positive effects for the brain, that is a true game changer. And that is something that a Pfizer uh, would want very, very much to, exactly. to, to have. Exactly. Uh, um, yeah, so, that, so that's super exciting. And that's why I'm so interested in this five the uh you know the 5ht2a and 5ht2c space so uh it, it's kind of interesting because with drug they were trading at a five million dollar market cap and yep. another company was purchased it wasn't their company and then they had a 40x appreciation in their market cap they're 5ht2c but you're also investigating 5ht2c what what do you think it's going to need to take for the 5-HT2A guys to see a move possibly like, you know, you know, they saw? Yeah, no, it's great. And, and I, I agree. This is why, you know, you got to the heart of the matter. This is what's so exciting in this sector right now is you're going to like bring it focus and say in the serotonergic space, heck, in the 5-HT2 space. We have companies out there like Bright Minds who have some great assets, have shown you know great advancement. And because of where the market's head has been for the last few years, because of what the market went through, you know, and uh, and with good reason, investors are like, forget all of this, right? <laughs> all of mm -hmm. this is only worth cash. These guys, I hate these guys. I mean, they got a good reason to feel that way because of the market dynamics you just described. And so I think we we have come to a point of oversold, a come to a point where great assets are being completely ignored. And, you know, Bright Minds is a great example of that. They're in this 5-HT-2C super agonist, a very specific space, a very specific application. But, you know, they're in phase two, as I recall. And... People are giving them no value, none, no value for all the work they've done and this great asset with its great potential until it gets validated. I mean, that's what happened here. Longboard with their phase three asset, but otherwise very similar, right? 5-HT2C super agonist going after the same indications. You look at the two and you say, huh, Bright Minds is not far behind Longboard. They're really mm -hmm. not. They're doing the same thing They've got a good shot at being the next one into the market and Longboard gets bought for two and a half billion, mm -hmm. right? These guys can't be worth 5 million. <laughs> like, no, no. It makes no sense. 
right? And what's nice is the market is actually finally acting rationally when when they you know somebody slaps them in the face and says, "Look at this." So on the two A side, again, it's very 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 close, right? We're just hitting a slightly different receptor. Um, it's something similar, right? We need it once you see a validation event like that. I would I would be surprised if you didn't see companies that were doing something similar suddenly take a huge leap as well, right? So you need, but you need a validation event and it's not today what I've noticed because obviously I pay very close attention to the companies in the markets, both the companies and the markets. Right now, the validation event, at least in the case of Longboard, hasn't been data. They've been, Bright Minds has been releasing their data, showing the progress they've been making and they've been getting zero value for it. It's the takeout, it's the business development validation mm -hmm. of the of this mechanism of the target, you know, this concept of a 5-HT2C super agonist. It's a new concept. So that concept getting validated, that's what did it. So I think if you see a business development validation of the 5-HT2A non-hallucinogenic molecules take place, then I would, I would be surprised if you didn't see a similar correction for other companies that are in the space. You know, and a great example might be there's a couple of private companies out there. The one we all know about is the AbV Gilgamesh option deal, or we, maybe we all know. Uh, Gilgamesh is a private company. So if you if you're focused exclusively on you know Nasdaq or publicly traded companies, you might have missed this. But mm -hmm. AbV has an option deal with Gilgamesh. So an option deal means they haven't they haven't exercised the option. But the option says they get $65 million if they exercise their option and agree to become the partner to Gilgamesh. AbV writes a $65 million check to Gilgamesh the first day. And then Gilgamesh stands to receive up to 1.9 billion in milestone payments plus royalties. Since you were asking what would it take, boy, if AbV exercises that option, that's pretty similar. That's almost saying- What's the timeline on that, you think? No idea. <laughs> right how can i know how can i but as a as an example right it's a, a tangible example of a potential event that would validate the 5-ht2a non-hallucinogenic neuroplastogen space that could do it yeah so so we need yeah and i i think I think that's very important context, you know, to to understand the market's thinking and low expectations at this point in time. You have to understand where we've come from and the, the poor returns of 2022 and 2023 weigh heavily on investor sentiment and psychology and some of the optimism that may have existed in 2021 is completely gone, right? And so you see that in the valuations, you see that in the share prices. And from an investment psychology standpoint, that is when most investors or, you know, contrary investors should begin to pay attention to a space, especially a tiny subsector of the biotech space. Um, and I believe what we saw with Bright Minds and, and Longboard is a real shot across the bow, hold on, there, there is big money playing here. There is big money paying attention to some of these product candidates that have been advanced to, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. It seems like an asset, a, a product candidate really needs to get to that phase two space to really attract the big money interest and the, the you know, billion dollar valuations that we all seek. Um, so, so, you know, tell us about, uh, you know, Enveric. So, where are you at? What's your your top candidate right now? And what are the potential catalysts that are going to create a move like drug? <laughs> right. So, and actually, I, I but just before I answer that question, I will say, historically, I would completely agree with you. You seem to need to get to phase two 
to to get that kind of you know multi billion dollar impact, and yet the Gilgamesh AbV option was put in place when, as far as we know, everything Gilgamesh has is preclinical. Mm. So they haven't exercised it. Maybe AbV won't exercise it until they get to phase two, but they put they papered that deal at the preclinical stage of of that company. Mm. So in Viric right now, we're also preclinical. We have our timeline gets us through as long as we hit everything, everything, you know, if everything goes according to plan, um, we are looking at getting into humans by the end of next year and completing a phase 1A and a phase 1B by the end of 2026, so two years from now. And our understanding from the pharmas we have talked to and our general knowledge of the space. And by the way, you mentioned, you know, pharma's what they want is a non-hallucinogenic pill you can take once a day. And I can completely verify that that's true. I've had many pharma conversations and they're very interested in that. They're very uninterested in a hallucinogenic molecule of any kind. Um, this is from direct conversations. But our understanding from our conversations is it really comes down to there's two big questions. Out, outstanding in this 5-HT2A neuroplastogen space. First question, underscored by Lycos's failure with MDMA, is does your molecule cause hallucination in humans? First big question, right? Why? Because what we saw with MDMA at the FDA is you, were, you get functional unblinding of your clinical trial meaning the patients, the doctors, everybody knows whether or not they got it. That's really, in my opinion, the reason the FDA did not approve the Lycos MDMA molecule, the functional unblinding. All the other stuff was, yeah, they did a lot of silly things that they shouldn't have done, but it's the functional unblinding that, in my mind, is the absolute deal killer. So first yeah. off, you've got to show that you're not hallucinogenic in humans. Second, You've got to answer the question, but if you take the hallucination away, does it still work? Right? Mm -hmm. So all this anecdote. That's a very important question. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you make your phase 1A and your phase 1B with those two questions in mind, perhaps you can answer both of them. And that's our intention. That's our strategy mm -hmm. is to answer both of those questions in the phase 1A and the phase 1B, respectively. If we do that, we're two years away from a potential you know, big catalytic event for us. Mm -hmm. Very big. Okay. I, that's, that sounds great. It makes a ton of sense. So how much capital do you need to get there, I guess, to get to the end of 2025 and start the phase 1 prep and then get to the end of 2026? and have the phase one B results. Yeah, we, we actually know that. I know the answer to that because I budgeted every single day. We, we basically need about 12 and a half million for each year. So 12 and a half, which covers all of our costs and the, you know, the program advancement, the asset development. So 12 and a half million will get us into humans. Another 12 and a half million will get us through the one A and the one B. So 25 total. Okay. And then, you know, how do you make that happen? Because for for a 200 uh, million market cap company, that's not that big a deal, right? You just do a financing. But for a $10 million market cap company, that's a, that's a bigger undertaking, right? Yeah, absolutely it is. So there's, and there's two things going on. I mean, I love that we're talking about Bright Minds because there they were, a 5 million market cap, this thing that really had nothing to do with them took place, their stock jumped and they ended up doing a $35 million private placement two days mm -hmm. later, right? Boom, they just funded the next stage of what they're doing because of that. Now, we can't count on something magical like that happening to us, yeah. <laughs> right? It'd be great. And if you're right, if it happened, then we suddenly would have all of that sorted out in 24 hours, for sure. Um, but in the absence of that, 
there's two real strategies for us. Um, one is partnerships, right? Conversations with big pharmas, big biotechs, and look for opportunities to have a partner come in, put some dollars in to be with us as we take the asset forward. So that's one non-dilutive way to do that. The other way is to be very strategic about our capital raising. And that's one of the things that we are, you know, we are happy about is that we have, we have put in place tools, um, ATM and equity line tools that allow us to take money on the best possible terms to our current shareholders. So if you know if you follow the Enveric stock, the ticker symbol on the Nasdaq is ENVB. So Echo Nancy Victor Bravo. You follow our stock like many low market cap companies. We go through periods of quiet and then periods of like amazing trading that might take a day or two, huge trading spikes. On those days, we can tap our ATM or our equity line and bring in a million dollars, $2 million with like no impact on the market and without creating any additional warrant overhang. We're able to do that because we've got 5 million shares one day and we trade 100 million shares. Well, you can easily issue a million shares into that and bring some money down without actually hurting your market cap at all. So we have- yeah, that's crazy. I see that back in early March or I guess late February, it traded over 100 million shares in a single day. What happened on that day? So that day we announced signing a non-binding term sheet to outlicense one of our other assets. So we have, you know, the, we are a platform company. I talk about our 003 is the name of our EB003 is the name of our non-hallucinogenic neuroplastogen. But we actually have an entire library of novel molecules, drug candidates that we've created. And some of those are currently being outlicensed by other companies. So, you know, that's the kind of, you know, catalytic event that you see from us from time to time. We have a validating event like, hey, somebody just came along and signed a deal to, to outlicense one of our molecules. The market goes, holy smokes, that actually validates what you're doing. And we get a crazy, you know, huge trading volume spike. We've occasionally had those spikes. You know, patents are very, very important in this space because so many of the molecules that the psychedelics companies, which I'm distancing us from, mm -hmm. worked on are essentially unpatentable. Or you can get a patent, but it doesn't actually stop anybody from doing it because psilocybin's already out there. 5-methoxy, DMT, MDMA, they're already out there. You can't patent something that's already out there. You can't stop people from working on it. Mm -hmm. We make novel compounds completely new. And when we get a composition of matter patent on that, it means something. Nobody can actually copy it now. So we do have those occasional spikes, huge trading volume spikes. And when that happens, we're able to, you know, very gently sell some shares into this huge volume spike, bring in some capital without knocking the stock price down. So we do have the ability to raise capital. You know, your favorite thing, one's favorite thing to do would be to have a private placement with fundamental investors like Bright Minds just did. It's a lot easier to do when you have a 200 million market cap than when you have, you know, a five to 10 million market cap for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, that, that, that's very helpful. And uh, what's your, your current cash in the treasury? So we currently have, and it's, it's kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It can, it can be a red herring, let's say, how much cash we have, because we're able to use our ATM and our equity line. So our, our last financials, I actually don't remember exactly what it was. It was like 5 million or 6 million, it might've been 6 million, something mm -hmm. like that on our last financials. And remember we, so we need about you know, 12 and a half million to advance the program in a given year. Mm -hmm. but remember we have those, watch our trading 
watch our trading, look at our stock chart for the last year, and you'll see it's quiet, kaboom, huge volume. It's quiet, kaboom, huge volume. Well, on those days, we can bring in the money for the next quarter, the next six months in a single day. So we're not loading up on cash. We're raising it as we need it. So we're just keeping our cash balance. We don't want to get it too low. We don't want it to drop below, you know, three or something. But generally what we're able to do is just tap the market from time to time and just keep topping it up. So that's what we're doing. Okay. Um, final question, Joseph, and then I'll let you go. This has been fantastic. I've, I've learned a lot about 5-HT2A, you know, and Varic and some of the possibilities here in this, this brain health space, which I think is, is a, is a boom, a boom market in a, you know, an area of, of real growth in the biotech sector. Um, what are some catalysts you think we can expect from the company over the next few months? So the big stuff for us is going to be, as I said, the, the, the huge catalyst coming down the road, that's when you show first off non hallucinogenic in humans, second off, efficacy in humans. Now to get into that, first you have to get into humans. So what we're doing right now is going through those final stages of what they call the IND enabling studies, the animal model studies that show that your molecule is safe, that it has no expected toxicities. Then you take that to the FDA and you request permission to start human studies. So that's your pre-IND meeting, your IND submission, your you know, late stage preclinical data, all of those things are happening right now. And so those will be, I'll call them the interim catalysts showing we're gonna get to those human studies where the huge catalysts next year will start to come into play. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, have a great afternoon. Cheers. Thanks so much. Take care, Robert.